Welcome to this week's edition of Flashback Friday, your opportunity to get some good review by listening to episodes from the past that Jason has handpicked to help you today in the present and propel you into the future. Enjoy. Speakers, publishers, consultants, coaches, and info marketers unite. The Speaking of Wealth Show is your roadmap to success and significance. Learn the latest tools, technologies, and tactics to get more bookings, sell more products, and attract more clients. If you're looking to increase your direct response sales, create a big-time personal brand, and become the go-to guru, the Speaking of Wealth Show is for you. Here is your host, Jason Hartman. Welcome to the Speaking of Wealth show. This is your host, Jason Hartman, where we discuss profit strategies for speakers, publishers, authors, consultants, coaches, info marketers, and just go over a whole bunch of exciting things that you can use to increase your business, to make your business more successful and more and more passive and more and more automated and more and more scalable. So we will be back with a great interview. Be sure to visit us at speakingofwealth.com. You can take advantage of our blog, subscribe to the RSS feed, and many other resources for free at speakingofwealth.com. And we will be back with a great interview for you in less than 60 seconds. What's great about the shows you'll find on jasonhartman.com is that if you want to learn how to finance your next big real estate deal, there's a show for that. If you want to learn more about food storage and the best way to keep those onions from smelling up everything else, there's a show for that. If you honestly want to know more about business ethics, there's a show for that. And if you just want to get away from it all and need to know something about world travel, there's even a show for that. Yep, there's a show for just about anything. Only from JasonHartman.com or type in Jason Hartman in the iTunes store. It's my pleasure to welcome Jason Mott to the show. He is a New York Times bestselling author. His latest book is The Returned, and he's got some others as well. And I think you'll be uh, very pleased to hear about his unique publishing success. Jason, welcome. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. Good, good. And you're coming to us from North Carolina, is that correct? Yes, from a little town called Bolton, which is in southeastern North Carolina. Excellent, excellent. Well, tell us about your career in publishing. It's, it's pretty unique, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely um, kind of reached a, a kind of very unique point. I started off as uh, a poetry writer, um, well, through college at least. I did an undergraduate degree in fiction and a graduate degree in poetry and started working at trying to get some poetry books published. In the meantime, I was also writing novel manuscripts here and there along the way. And I got two poetry books picked up um, through different uh, publishing companies here in North Carolina, and they were printed, and it was very exciting. And at the same time, I was working on novels, as I mentioned, and I finished the manuscript, sent it out to a few agents, and got lucky enough to find an agent eventually. Um, and then the novel got picked up, and television rights got optioned, and now it's a television series on ABC, and things just happen really quickly. Fantastic. Well, congratulations on your success. It's pretty awesome. So, you know, my understanding is that you wrote The Returned, and that's your latest, while working as a customer service rep at a Verizon call center. (laughs) Is this true? That is absolutely true. Um, When you graduate from college with a master's in poetry, there's not a lot of jobs lining up for you. (laughs) (laughs) So so you get a job at the Verizon call center with your uh, master's in poetry, right? (laughs) Exactly, exactly. (laughs) This is a crazy world in which we live. How did you do that while working? I mean, has Verizon sent you a nasty letter and asked for their money back saying that you were uh, sleeping on the job, basically? <laughs> <laughs> um, thankfully, no. Um, the time that Verizon, you know, I, I did manage to get the job done. There's a unique, a unique thing about that job. Ultimately, there's only about four or, five, four or five different types of calls. And once you kind of learn that, it becomes a very routine job. It's just people kind of call in for a few, few of the same problems. You learn to tackle those problems. So what I would do is, because I had managed to get pretty good writing habits, so every day that I went into to work, I would take me a notebook and I would have my problem of the day for writing. Um, you know, so that morning I would kind of pick out, you know, I need to work on this character or I need to work on this section of the project. And I would go to work, and as people are yelling at me in my ear behind their phone is broken, um, I would sit there and make notes about all these different things that I was working on for the characters and for the story. And I would go home at night and just kind of do a download, just type all of it out and work out the problems. And I kept doing that, just that kept the motion going. 
So you didn't bring your laptop to the Verizon call center? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I wasn't quite that bold. <laughs> okay, all right. So you, you brought a notebook in there, and as people are going on and on about their phone problems, you're actually <laughs> writing a book. Exactly. Um, I was just at it every single day. And, you know, talking to people on the phone all day, you get some really interesting character notes. You know, you find people that have weird habits or just weird voices and the way they speak. So it, it was actually all good fodder for building characters, for building other stories and projects. Um, so it, it worked out really well, actually. Well, be careful, because uh, by saying that, you know, Verizon might ask you for royalties. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, use the, you use their customers as character development, huh? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Like, wouldn't, that's, wouldn't surprise me. <laughs> that, that's, that's fascinating. Well, just out of curiosity, I, I mean, i got to just expand on this Verizon thing a little bit because it's so darn unique. Sure. I mean, Jason, come on. This is, a, this is a rather crazy story, you must admit. What sort of, I mean, there are only four different problems people call with, you say, huh? Yeah, exactly. There's only, um, there's, you know, something's wrong with my bill, something's wrong with my phone, I want a new phone. Or, you know, I'm just kind of calling it because I'm frustrated in general. Those are pretty much all of the calls that you actually get. <laughs> okay. um, you know, they come in different flavors. They're dressed up differently as they come in, but they're really the same kind of calls. So, you know, a minute and a half into the call, you, you already know what, kind of, what call type it is. You just kind of start going through the pattern of getting the problem taken care of in that format. And at that point, you know, you can kind of, you know, mentally, you can kind of, you know, start working on the project. You can start kind of do a few things on the side as you're, as you're having someone check their phone or check their bill or whatever it is. It's amazing how you could, you know, you could multitask. You learned to multitask really, really well working there. Jason, I can just picture this now. Will you hold, please? Let me check with my supervisor. And while they're on hold, <laughs> you're actually writing a book. <laughs> Crazy. Well, I try to keep it from putting on hold. I, I don't like getting put on hold, so I try not to do that. Um, <laughs> but that's, that's a brief summary of how it all happened, yeah. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Okay, so, so just take us into the character. I mean, what would happen? The irate customer would call and start yelling and screaming. And, and how did that lead to character de development for the book? Oh, yeah, definitely. Like, um, people would call in and, like, you know, as soon as the call comes in, they're just, they're blasting you. You know, your company sucks and you're terrible and I can't believe it. Like, they, you know, they would go at it for a minute and a half, two minutes before they even told you exactly what the problem actually was. They just kind of had to vent. But one thing that was always unique is typically if you let them kind of get it out, they calm down and, then, you know, you can actually figure out what the problem was. So it was something where you learned about, for me, I learned a lot about people and about people's behavior. You know, I learned that, you know, people speak indirectly about the things they really want. You know, if they really want to have something done with their bill, they're going to talk about five other things that are going on until they get around to it. And it just made for wonderful fodder for characters. You know, you, I could create these characters who, who did talk in a roundabout way, who kind of, you know, were kind of, kind of like to fight each other a little bit, but they really were kind of loving. It's, it's amazing how people people don't talk directly, but they try to, you know, if you just listen to what they're saying indirectly, you can really find out what they're looking for. So tell us how the discovery happened. I mean, uh, my understanding, and this is another totally unique part of your story, is the, the book was haphazardly discovered on a mail pile, pile of mail, I should say, <laughs> when a literary agent who was just kind of bored waiting for a meeting picked it up. Uh, what what happened there? Yeah, actually it would be the intern that kind of found it. Um, I'd send it out to a bunch of different, you know, sent query letters out to a lot of different agents, got rejection letters from a great deal of agents. So I didn't think the project was going to go anywhere. And then you know, after a few months and kind of, you know, a whole stack of rejections, yeah, I won't say I'd given up, but I definitely got to the point where I was starting to, I was ready to move on to the next project, just kind of, you know, ready to put in the back burner. And then I got contact. I got an email from this, this intern who said that she kind of, she had stumbled across it and she liked it and she wanted to pass it up the chain to the actual agent. And she did. And then a few days later, I got a phone call from the agent saying that she had read the book and loved it and wanted to work with me. And things started there. You know, we started learning how to, how to be an agent and a client. So we got their whole initial process. And it was a really case where this, this, this intern who probably wasn't getting paid very much at all discovered me. So I'm very still in her debt to this day. That's fantastic. What an amazing story. Well, what advice do you have for people uh, who are aspiring writers or already writers in terms of uh, getting books published, self-publishing, writing, uh, you know, just anywhere you want to take it? Oh, sure. Um, yeah, I could talk at length about that. Um, lots, of, lots of advice. <laughs> I think one of the biggest things that I, I've learned, and I was actually speaking to someone about this uh, earlier today, is that there's an apprenticeship period that writers kind of have to go through. And it's a very grueling, very tough period. Some people call it, you know, paying your dues. I actually think of it a little differently. 
for me, the return was probably my fifth or sixth manuscript that I'd actually written, like a full length actual book that I'd actually written. And those others went nowhere. They're still sitting in the closet, just completely terrible books. But the reason for that is it took me those five or six other manuscripts to learn how to tell the long story. You know, writing in the long form is very, very difficult. It takes practice. It takes training. And so there's this, I think there's a, a habit to think that the first book you write has to be the first book that gets published because, you know, you're, you're a writer. And if you don't do it in the first book and you're not meant to do it, but I think it's actually the accent, the opposite of that. You know, you have to write that first book and expect it to be a failure. Like you cannot put all your hopes into that first novel. You go back to the second novel and the third novel. And each time you do that, you learn more about telling a story of 90,000 words. It takes practice to do that. So that's one of the biggest tips I tell people, you know, don't be afraid to, to serve your time and to learn more about writing. If you finish that first manuscript, start your next one. Don't, don't hang up. Don't put all your eggs in one basket. Don't worry about that first book. Finish it. Send out queries. Then start the next one immediately. Just keep writing. You have to keep writing. So persistence. We've heard that one yeah. before, but it's certainly true. You know, you got to earn your earn your way and learn how to craft the long story. But, you know, you say that crafting the long story is difficult, and I certainly agree with you that it is. When you look at your first couple of manuscripts that were your apprenticeship, the, the ones that will probably never be published, what changed? I mean, what's the difference? What did you learn specifically in terms of writing the long story? I think a lot of it for me was learning learning the difference between writing toward writing to yourself and writing to an audience. Um, you know, whenever you're writing a, a novel or a poem, whenever you're writing anything, you have to remember that you're writing for other people. Um, when I look at those first couple of manuscripts, the stories that I told there were very much stories, very specific to me. It's like, there are a lot of things that don't get explained because in my brain, I knew what the explanation was, but I hadn't really learned yet where to bridge that, how, how to bridge that gap between the author and the reader. You have to learn how to bridge that gap. You know, having a wonderful story is good, but if you're having a wonderful story that the only person on the planet who understands what's really happening in it is you, you actually have a pretty bad story that's hard to kind of, you know, hard for anyone else to get into. So in those early manuscripts, I hadn't yet learned the value of the reader and how to speak to the reader and not just speaking to myself in the actual writing. And as I went on through the other manuscripts, I think I got better at that. I learned a little bit more about how, you know, this scene is telling the reader this. Um, and I learned how to tweak those scenes and kind of tie it up a little bit better to where it spoke in the way I wanted it to speak. Yeah. Are your books released on uh, audio as well? Yes. Uh, it's on audio. It's on um, you know digital, all that kind of good stuff. It's in all different formats. And do you do your own narration? Um, no, I do not, actually. The publisher has a wonderful narrator who, who did a terrific job with it. So at this point, no, I do not do my own narration. <laughs> yeah. I'm just kind of curious when you talk about telling the story and the difference between telling it to yourself in your own mind and then to outsiders. Yeah, it's, um, I think it's a very interesting process. I learned a lot of it from doing public readings, actually. Um, myself and a friend, we hosted this reading series where every few months we just kind of read short stories or poems or whatever. And every time I went and did that reading, I would learn a little bit more about how the story that I was telling, how, you know, the reaction that it got from readers and what points people were kind of hung up on as, as listeners. And you just learn a lot about narrative and how it interacts with actual audience members, you know, or readers or whoever they are. So that was a very helpful period for me as well. Now, see, that's a great tip you just gave. Doing public readings helped you understand how to tell a story to an audience because, you know, you get instant feedback from the audience. Do they get it? Exactly. You can, you can tell by their yeah. body language if they're understanding what you're saying. Exactly. You can tell, you know, if they understand what you're saying, you can tell when they're kind of drifting off, which means that your, your writing is falling a little flat. You can tell when they're really into it. You know, if you hit a good note, you can hear people in the audience kind of hold their breath a little bit. Um, you really learn what you have on the page as opposed to just kind of thinking what you have there. You can watch the action. You can sit there and read the story and hear and see what the story is doing to people. And that really will help you refine your process as a writer. You can learn what tools make certain things happen to readers or listeners. And it is an absolutely invaluable tool that I think few writers take advantage of. You know, we get afraid to do public readings because we're afraid to be in front of a crowd and put ourselves out there. But it really does help. It helps in tremendous ways. Yeah, I, I would totally agree with you, Jason. That's a very, very interesting point. And I, I really would doubt that many fiction writers would think that they need to practice their public speaking to be better fiction writers. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I know a lot of fiction writers who, I think they're great on the page, but they're, they're not, they haven't learned how to read aloud. 
it's like you read that work and you love it and you go to hear them read and you're kind of like, oh, that actually fell a little bit flatter than I thought it would be because they're just learning how to read in front of a crowd and how to really tell a story is it takes practice. Sure. Yeah. No question about it. Tell us about your movie deal. I mean, Brad Pitt bought the TV rights. Is that correct? <laughs> he did. Uh, his, his production company, Plan B, picked up the television oh. rights. Um, and I have not met Mr. Pitt. People always ask if I met Brad Pitt. I have not met him yet. Maybe one day. Um, <laughs> But it was a it was a fun process. Um, the the when I when we, when we actually found a publisher for it, my agent sent the book to a wonderful film rights guy, and he went off and kind of did whatever magic that he does. And about a month or so after we kind of found a publisher, he sent me an email saying that there were a few different networks and one film studio all interested in the project. And so when Plan B, which is the one owned by Brad Pitt, when they kind of came on board. I was already a fan of theirs. I'm a big movie buff. So I knew who they were and I knew their body of work. Um, they tend to specialize in both the film translations. So I was really kind of already leaning in their direction to start with. And during the talking process of, you know, trying to talk about if they wanted the project, they, their vision is kind of along with my vision for the project. They wanted to keep it true to the spirit of the story, um, but also kind of bring in new characters and make their own movements as well. And I think we were just a good fit. We kind of understood each other pretty well. So they optioned it. I really didn't expect it to go anywhere. Um, options get, you know, books get optioned fairly frequently, but it's rare that you actually see them go into production. And so it was optioned, and I was waiting, you know, expecting not to hear much about it. And then two months later, they had a writer for the pilot. A month after that, they had a director for the pilot. And then they started casting for the pilot. Um, things happened dramatically fast. You know, the book had not even been released yet. We were still all, you know, almost a year away from actually having the book released. They were fasting and... They shot a pilot, pilot down in Atlanta back in March of last year, and pilot got picked up in May of last year. They shot the whole season over the summer before the book had even launched. So it's just been an absolute whirlwind in that regard. Yeah, it sure has. It sure has. Are you at liberty to talk about the business deal? I mean, you know, what 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 did you charge them to option it, and you know, what did they pay for it? I mean, if you'll share that, I'm sure our listeners would be very interested. Um, no, unfortunately, we're not allowed to kind of discuss that. Okay. All right. I just thought I'd ask. <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So that's interesting. So now, has that actually been released and appeared on TV yet? Yes, actually. It's about five episodes in. It's on ABC Network. It's called Resurrection. It aired on May 9th and got wonderful ratings. Something like 20 million viewers tuned in. It was one of the most highly rated debuts of this year. Um, and they're about five episodes in and doing a terrific job with it. So yes, it is running Sunday nights at 9 p.m. on ABC. So, you know, when it comes to the business side of, of, of writing, I mean, is is the money in the in the TV deal uh, or is it possible for authors really to make real money on just strictly books? Most people in our industry think it, the book is just a lead-in. It's a business card. It's an entry point. It's a tripwire to a movie deal or a tripwire to uh, selling one's own services, for example, if it's a business person, <laughs> or other things like that, maybe to consulting work, depending on you know what the subject matter is, of course. I'm sure. talking nonfiction in most of those. What, how, how, how does that play out? Um, I would say that the, the TV, TV deals are, are really um, kind of – I would say overrated, but I think people expect their, the reality of them and the expectation of them are two very different things. TV deals are not huge amounts. Like you're not going to retire from a TV deal. You're not going to change your whole life from a TV deal or anything of that manner. Same thing for movie deals. You know, unless, unless you're a J.K. Rowling or someone of that manner, it, TV deals are secondary. It really should be. If you're a writer and you plan to write novels, you should really focus on just the craft of writing those novels. That's where you'll build your reputation, build your repertoire, build this body of work that you can really stand in and kind of represent um, you know, who you are and build your career off of that. You know, with television and film, you know, getting, a, getting one option to begin with is difficult enough, but going from optioning to production is a dramatically difficult. To kind of perspective, when you know, the television series went up for pilot last year, you know, there's a pilot season, the networks kind of choose the shows they want to watch and things like that, and the one they want to pick up for the fall. So the television series that we you know that got an option, my book, it was one amongst about 180 television pilots all trying to get picked up. And I think ABC wound up picking up maybe six new shows. So even if you get a, if you, if you get option for a, um, for a project, and even if it gets produced as a pilot, you're still one among about 180 shows all vying for the same six positions. So those are the odds you're fighting against. 
Those are pretty big odds. That's very true. But on the television show, I mean, you do get ongoing royalties, right? Um, yes, you do get ongoing royalties. Um, but those are, you know, those are kind of percentages as well. So even that number isn't quite as uh, as grand as it may seem. You know, if you if you do have something in a television series and it gets picked up for syndication, then you know other things come into play and you kind of make out a little bit better in that regard. But syndication is, you know, has to run for five years, which is you know against all odds as well. So, you know, there's definitely a lot more complicated aspects to the whole process and people kind of think it is. That's the main thing I want to kind of convey. Right. All right. Okay. Good. Good point. And, and I'd just like to ask you a couple more questions before you go. First of all, what places would you recommend that, you know, writers can learn their craft better uh, outside of working at a Verizon call center? <laughs> you know, are, are there any books that you'd recommend, any online courses, university courses, whatever? Sure. Um, there are two books that I definitely highly recommend. One is titled uh, simply The Art of Fiction, and it is written by John Gardner. Um, he's a fabulous writer who's one of my major influences as a writer, um, and his, his book just really breaks down what fiction is and kind of how to write. Um, the second one is actually Stephen King's book, Writing Down the Bones. Um, he does a tr- just brilliant job of really kind of showing you you know, how to become a writer. Um, he, he's very good at explaining things. So those two books in and of themselves are wonders for you. Um, the other tip that I would give is to look for writing conferences. Um, there are lots of writes, writing conferences all across the U.S. Um, and almost any of them will, you know, will help you become a better writer because what they do is they put you in a room with other writers and you learn to exchange work and learn to see other writers writing from like a critical standpoint. And that helps you look at your own writing from a critical standpoint as well. So those two books and then writing conferences with other writers is, you know, build that community of writers around you, trade work with people. That's the biggest help you can get. What do you think of writers? And I, I kind of have a feeling you're going to say you don't use any of this, but some writers do. What do you think about software for writing? Yeah, I have not used any software writing. I've heard a lot about it. Um, a lot, you know, there are things with Scribner and a few other things I've heard of that kind of help you organize your thoughts. Um, I think whatever works, if you're, if, if that kind of software helps you, then by all means, go for it. I think I'm still kind of old school. I use dry erase boards for charting out um, character outlines and things of that matter. But I, my philosophy is whatever works to make you a better writer, use that tool and make it part of your life. So if someone finds writing software to be very helpful for them, by all means, use it. Fantastic. Jason, give out your website. Tell people where they can find you. Sure. Uh, my website is jasonmottauthor.com. If you go there to give you information on update, upcoming events, news about books and all that kind of good stuff, it's the best place to go and you know, help you find Facebook account, find my Twitter account, jasonmottauthor.com. Excellent. Well, Jason Mott, thank you so much for sharing your ideas and your true inspiration. Uh, that was uh, fantastic to learn from you. And, and the funniest part is that Verizon call center stuff. I just love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was a good time. Thank you so much for having me. All right. <laughs> This show is produced by the Hartman Media Company, all rights reserved. For distribution or publication rights and media interviews, please visit www.hartmanmedia.com or email media at hartmanmedia.com. Nothing on this show should be considered specific personal or professional advice. Please consult an appropriate tax, legal, real estate, or business professional for individualized advice. Opinions of guests are their own, and the host is acting on behalf of Platinum Properties Investor Network, Inc., exclusively.